support of the revolutionary communist group and I'm going to go into a little bit more detail about the um, energy, uh, sustainable energy uh, achievements of the Cuban revolution but also about the, a few of the agro-ecological achievements of the revolution. So as was mentioned in the video, uh, with the collapse of the Soviet Union in 1991 and the subsequent dissolution of the socialist bloc uh, internationally, Cuba entered into a period of economic crisis during which it lost approximately 80% of imports, 80% of exports, and its gross domestic product dropped by 34%. To give a you know, comparison to that, the 2008 crisis that occurred here, the crisis within which that, rep what that represented within the economy accounted for 5% of the GDP of our country. So you can imagine the comparative the crisis we would experience here, and, and you know, and what we'd be told, what we'd have to go through as a population um, if we had such a crisis under the system. Uh, this crisis came to be known as a special period, and it was defined centrally by shortages in uh, many imported goods, and especially gasoline, diesel, and other petroleum de derivatives, <coughs> and that became quite significant in their subsequent development. Just 15 years later, in 2006, the World Wildlife Fund Living Planet Report pointed to Cuba as the only nation in the world to achieve sustainable development, <laughs> which it described as having a United Nations Development Index of 0 0.8 or more, so to not say, you know, to avoid the argument, so well, they weren't developing, so that was why they were sustainable. So they were actively developing uh, with a measure of human demand on the biosphere of 1.8 global hectares or less. That Cuba is able to achieve sustainable development is because it is socialist. Collective ownership and central planning, along with a grassroots system of participatory democracy that was mentioned in the, in the video, facilitate the rational allocation of resources for the benefit of populations collective, the population's collective interest. In 2014, the Cuban government stated that it intends to source 24% of its electricity from renew renewable sources by 2030. And the Cuban revolution's commitment to sustainable development and the protection of the environment is to be enshrined in Cuba's new constitution, which is currently being discussed and debated in Cuba's various democratic structures and nationwide grassroots community organizations. Cuba has been heavily dependent on imported oil from Venezuela, uh, receiving an average daily import of 98,000 barrels at preferential prices between 2000 and 2015. But since 2016, the economic war waged by the US and Venezuela's ruling classes uh, against Venezuela's progressive Bolivarian government and movement forced Venezuela to drop its exports to Cuba by 40%. For Cuba, this has increased the urgency of energy security and sustainability. And if people have been following the news on Venezuela at the moment, that threat to the Venezuelan uh, Bolivarian movement is at an all-time high right now with the challenge from you know, reactionaries uh, regionally like Bolsonaro and Juan Guaido in Venezuela, in Venezuela but also Trump and Europe and Britain uh, internationally. But we can go come to that in the discussion after as well. Um, currently, about 5% of Cuba's energy is produced by renewable sources, but there is a huge potential for renewable energy development due to Cuba's geography, giving access to a variety of biofuel sources, a windy coastline and generous amounts of sunshine. Luis Beres, Beres Perez, president of the state enterprise Cuba Solar, explained that Cuba's territory of 111,000 square kilometers re receives solar radiation equivalent to the energy produced by 50 million tons of oil every day. That is, that solar radiation Cuba receives in a single day is greater in its energy value than all the oil consumed in five years. However, there are major barriers to energy development and harnessing that potential not least the US blockade that has uh, been imposed since 1960. Um, as a result, Cuba has been forced to look outside of the US's 
sphere of influence for solutions to its energy needs. In a recent development, China has stepped in to aid in advancing Cuba's sustainable energy ambitions. In April last year, the Chinese ambassador to Cuba oversaw the opening of two solar energy farms with a total capacity of nine megawatts. At the inauguration event, in which the ambassador handed over control of the parks to the Cuban government, the Cuban deputy for energy and mines, Ruben Sid, explained that the, those facilities are just part of a wider solar panel program financed by the Chinese Ministry of Commerce with a total capacity of 21 megawatts. Cuba's current existing sustainable energy infrastructure is concentrated in the production of bioenergy and its uh, biotechnology um, sector is very, very advanced. Um, this is driven by the, new, uh, the nation's historical industry of um, sugar production and the sugarcane harvest uh, industry in which the gas, which is the pulp residue from harvesting um, sugarcane, is uh, burned to turn turbines, which in turn generate electricity. In 2015, of the 566 megawatts of sustainable energy, 83% was from bioenergy sources. Um, as of 2016, the Cuban Ministry of Mines and Energy reported that there were approximately 2,000 small-scale biodigesters across the country and 700 biogas plants which convert animal waste into energy, operating on state and private farms. This is on top of six larger biogas facilities that were built in the last two years prior to that. Cuba has a capacity to make 400 million cubic meters of biogas annually, which is enough to run an 85 megawatt electricity generation plant. This would eliminate more than 3 million tons of carbon dioxide emissions and would save around 190,000 tons of oil. So it's quite, a, you know, for a small, historically underdeveloped nation, they have quite an impressive um, infrastructure. Mm -hmm. uh, Cuba advances in sustainable development are not solely reserved to its energy production sector. When Christopher Columbus arrived on the island that, um, that became the Republic of Cuba, 95% approximately is estimated to have been covered by forest land. At the triumph of the revolution in 1959, 11% was covered in forest land. Mm -hmm. Now, 30.6% is uh, covered by forest as a result of a reforestation program that began in 1998 and that was reported as the most advanced in Latin America and the Caribbean in a 2011 report by the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations. As well as this, Cuba's urban organic farming infrastructure, not known as the Organiponicos, have been described in an article by the Architectural Review as, quote, an exemplary precedent that could be applied worldwide. According to the data collected by the UN Food and Agriculture Organization, some 795 million people in the world do not have enough food to lead a healthy, active life. About one in nine people on earth. This is a clear indication that capitalist industrial agriculture has failed to de deliver satisfactory results for the majority of humanity. And these industrial food systems affect human health and broader ecological systems. In Cuba, during the, spe the, during the special period that I mentioned earlier, average calorie intake was said to have dropped as low as between 1,000 and 1,500 calories per day from an average 2,600 calories in the late 1980s. And it's said that you, on average, need about 2,500 calories a day to live a healthy, active lifestyle. So, you know, a huge um, fall due to that economic crisis. Almost overnight, according to the Cuban Organic Support Group, the Ministry of Agriculture established an urban uh, gardening culture and thus the unique system of organic farmicos, or, or urban organic farming was born. By 1995, Havana had 250, uh, sorry, 25,000 allotments farmed by families in small groups and dozens of larger scale organic farmicos, or market gardens. The immediate crisis of hunger was ended. Now, gardens for food take up 3.4% of urban land countrywide and 3, 000, uh, 30, sorry, 35,000 hectares or 8% of all of the total land of Havana. 
Cuba produced 3.2 million tons of organic food uh, in urban farms in 2002, and the UN Food and Agriculture Organization says food intake is back at 2,600 calories a day. So, you know, when you hear about people, as they regularly do, who go to Cuba and say, oh, well, they're all starving, it's like, well, even the, the UN recognizes that that's not the case. Um, the success of this program is described as due, being due to a combination of top-down state support and ground-up citizen participation. Hmm. In 2016, the World Wildlife Foundation, uh, once a, uh, World Wildlife Fund, once again announced in its biannual report that, the, that Cuba was the most sustainable country on earth. With regard to sustainable development, Cuba is consistently demonstrated that it stands head and shoulders not just above other countries in the region with similar, similar historical, geographical, and economic context, which is always important to put into context Cuba when we, when we you know, criticize it, but also above many countries that we consider first world countries. It is only able to realize these achievements against all the odds due to socialism, the great system of collectivized economic planning that puts the interests of the masses first, and I thought that was a beautiful quote. As Francisco Domingo said in the video you just saw, the great author, the great hero of all of this is the Cuban people who learn to live with scarcities and overcome this situation. Thank you. Yeah.